Hello everybody, my name is Tank Runner, and welcome to another episode of Drawing Roulettes and World Building. Today, we're going to continue working on our project to create a new Pokemon region. Last episode, we created our starters, Brambi, the Bilby Pokemon, who evolves into Billivine, and then Bandicrush, Shadle, the Dingo Pokemon, who evolves into Phasmahound, and then Macabraith, and Plubble, the Platypus Pokemon, who evolves into Puddlespur, and then Barnami. In this video, I'll be covering the Pokemon you can encounter in our region's first route. But I want to kick us off with a few updates and some world building. So if you're not interested in that and just want to skip to the part where you get to see all the adorable monsters, here's a time code for that. Are they gone? All right, cool. You guys are my favorites anyway. But uh, don't tell them that I said that though, okay? I'm assuming that if you've stuck around for this part, you're either interested in the backstory of this region or you're a regular to my channel. Either way, I really appreciate it. Should we come up with a name for you guys? A lot of YouTubers do that, right? Name their viewers? Comment below with a few name ideas for our community. That way I know who the cool kids are. Okay, let's start with some good news. The last Pokemon video that I did has exploded and it's still growing. I'm getting so much interaction from people and a few of you even subscribed. You have no idea how much that means to me and I'm gonna try my hardest to keep you guys entertained for the foreseeable future. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty world building stuff. Last episode, I told you guys I wanted the region to be based on Australia exclusively, but with your help, I've decided to open it up a bit more and include more of Oceania. Thanks to Pharaoh for the great idea. That'll give us so much more to work with while still keeping the general feel I was going for originally. I have a few ideas for the starting town that I think you guys might like. I want our region to be a fairly dangerous place compared to previous ones. If you're not prepared to leave the safety and comfort of the city walls, chances are people don't expect to see you again. So with that being said, I think maybe this region has a stricter age requirement to become an official trainer, and there's probably classes you have to pass before gaining your license in the first place. They've done things like schools and starting areas before, but I think there's still a lot of stuff to work with there that they haven't even touched on yet. Usually they're just there as a poorly hidden tutorial, but what if ours has actual challenges to test your proficiency as a would-be trainer? They send you out to the first route, could be a park or a rural area inside the walls, giving you a chance to train in a safe environment and to catch a few new Pokemon. Maybe the final test is the first gym leader. Beat them, earn a badge, and be given the documents needed to head out into the wild and start your journey. I think it has some promise, what do you guys think? Let me know. With the designs I did for our Route 1, I stuck with the tradition. Reliable, normal types. Thick boys that can carry the team before being stored away, lost, but not forgotten. But the best part is, in our region, we don't have to store them away if we don't want to, thanks to us trying to keep our Pokémon a bit more balanced. Just a quick recap of how I do the stats in this series. I have a really hard time understanding what stats are considered high or low, how that changes depending on the Pokemon, or how that scales with level. So for the time being, I've created my own system to simplify things. Each Pokemon will have a score out of 5 in each stat, and their evolutionary stage will determine how many points they have to put into all their stats. The only downside here is that stat-wise, you can compare my Pokemon to each other, but you won't be able to compare my Pokemon to Game Freaks. But don't worry, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Route 1 Pokemon are usually pretty tame, a bird, a rodent, most of the time at least part normal type, based on common wildlife in the area. We'll stick close to those parameters, but we're not going to be afraid to go outside the lines, because in places like Australia, even common animals are extremely unique. We'll start with our Route 1 bird. I know a lot of people don't like the starter birds, because they're usually just you know, birds, but I'm gonna try and have a little fun with it. Piper, the magpie Pokemon. Over the many years of living in similar locations, Piper have become very friendly towards people. Most trainers are able to catch these Pokemon with just a handful of grubs. But don't be easily distracted by their pleasant songs and cheery personality. These tiny birds can't help themselves but collect small trinkets that they deem valuable even if they have to pluck it from the pocket of a passerby. Two fun facts about magpies that I've learned while researching for this episode. One, magpies gather for funerals when a magpie dies. And two, there's an old superstition that if you see a single magpie and you don't greet it and ask it about its wife and kids, the magpie will give you bad luck. That doesn't really have anything to do with this video. I just thought it was neat.
Trillark, the evolved form of Piper. Trillark are rarely seen. The only way to know of a Shrillark's presence is to identify their unique high-pitched trill. If Shrillark have been heard in the area, do not eat food outside unless you're prepared to lose it. These Pokemon dive down with incredible speed on any food that is remotely visible, making those at things like grill outs and picnics their main victims. So there's actually a few different types of magpies that exist, and I've been using different ones as inspiration for the Piper line. This final evolution is based on a magpie goose. I honestly don't know why, but I can't not see Matt LeBlanc in this goose. Shredshrike, the evolved form of Shrillark. A Shredshrike's talons are sharp enough that they can puncture steel, even when flying at low speeds. Shredshrike are also said to symbolize a bad omen, either present or future. Superstitions state that they come to pay their respects to those recently lost, or to warn those of a coming tragedy. Next up is our Route 1 Rodent, which I don't think is actually a rodent? Pinley, the Echidna Pokemon. Pinley are extremely common, but you wouldn't know that by how hard they can be to find in the wild. This Pokemon tries to stay away from travelers and is known to be quite shy and jumpy, a trait gained from being regularly stepped on by unaware hikers. The most common hiking injury in areas that have been made home by Pinley is a foot filled with quills. If you've made it this far, thanks for checking out the show. I hope you're liking the Pokemon so far. If you want to keep up with the series and help us come up with some awesome ideas as we go, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell. Quillaquake, the evolved form of Pinley. Quillaquake may still be hard to spot in the wild, but it's not because they are still the timid Pokemon they once were. Quillaquake love to play in mud. They roll in it, sunbathe in it, they'll even use it as a means to cool off on a hot day. Because of this, they can sometimes blend in with clumps of dirt or nearby brush. Quillaquake is not recommended for trainers that lack patience, as these Pokemon can have a hard time understanding how big they've grown and can sometimes come across as a bit self-centered because of it eating more than their share, or taking up space in the most inconvenient places. Sometimes the first route in a region has more than two Pokemon to pick from, and those are the kinds of routes that I prefer, so we have one last Pokemon line to go over. Kokos, the sugar glider Pokemon. Kokos love to climb trees, and can normally be seen gliding through the canopies of any forest with a temperate climate. The cornerstone of this Pokemon's diet is sugar, so small gatherings of Kokos will often follow travelers from one side of the forest to the other if they catch even the slightest scent of something sweet on them. I'm not usually a fan of the cute Pokemon whose whole shtick is that they are cute, but I know for an evolutionary line like this, the designs have to be adorable. So I'm gonna try and come up with something that most people like myself will enjoy, but will still grab the attention of cafe goers and the Pokemon contest crowd. 
Chocoloft, the evolved form of Cocos. There has never been a violent encounter with a wild Cocoloft. They will always be friendly to complete strangers. Even when their homes are attacked by other Pokemon, they care more about making sure the rest of their colony makes it out safe and sound. Local researchers believe that the Cocoloft line may share a distant but common ancestor with Gligar and Gliscor, Pokemon native to the Johto and Sinnoh regions, but they've yet to find enough evidence to prove that for sure. All right, 16 down, 135 to go. How do you think it's going so far? Leave a comment telling me what Pokemon your team would consist of at this point in the game. I know there's not a lot to choose from yet, but I'm still interested in seeing what you guys say. I'm still not even really completely sure which starter I would have picked. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. If you want to take a crack at drawing any of the prompts I've done, or you want to send me some artwork to help flesh out some of my worlds, please send them to me over on my Twitter. I'd love to see what you guys make. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.